everyone for coming here. We are uh, extremely delighted to have uh, Seth with us uh, uh, tonight. Um, I got to know him a few months ago. We were at a conference uh, where his work was extremely exciting and interesting. So I thought we must have him here at Princeton. So we're delighted he could join us. Uh, Seth uh, was at Google as the chief data scientist, and I'm understanding him. He was just step down to do uh, bigger uh, things. He's uh, writing for the New York Times and uh, working on a book as well. Uh, Seth himself will explain why he's so interesting. <laughs> uh, thanks, Atim, for having me and inviting me. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for attending uh, this talk. And, uh, I would be more interesting if I was ever the chief of the scientist at Google. I was not the chief data scientist at Google. That's a, a data scientist. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, so basically uh, I'm going to discuss uh, my talk, uh, some of my research on how to use Google to trans data. This is something I started, uh, I was a PhD student about two and a half years ago at Harvard Economics doing my PhD, and I discovered uh, Google Trends and the clouds just parted. I was totally lost, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I didn't have a dissertation topic, and I was kind of burnt out in economics, I'm like, this is amazing. This is kind of like, there's data on Google Trends on you know, what people search in different locations over time. And I just thought it was really, really amazing and a great way to get new insights into people. Uh, I kind of, you know, I kind of said then, and I still think that it's in some sense the most remarkable data set that we've ever collected about the human psyche. And it's only getting better as uh, more and more people around the world start using the internet and start using Google. Uh, so I think what this talk I want to kind of focus on, and. Uh, you're never going to be able to cover everything. It's kind of a few different ways. These are three different essays, uh, papers that I wrote using Google's data in different ways to kind of capture something that is otherwise hard to measure. Uh, and I hope it'll inspire other people to use this data set more. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm writing a book uh, on this topic and also doing a New York Times column, a monthly column, where I kind of... These essays are a little more fleshed out than my uh, columns. Uh, my columns are kind of more provocative. Uh, way, ways you can use these three data sources to get new insights uh, into people. So what is Google data? Uh, I think when I first started doing this talk, if I showed something like, if I said Google Trends, I think maybe 2% of people in the audience knew what I was talking about. I think now it's a lot higher, uh, maybe 50 or 60%, I think it's kind of getting into the zeitgeist uh, that Google has a lot of great data on people. So you can Google Google Trends or go to google.com slash trends and you can play around with it and, uh, and, and see, basically you can put in terms and uh, get information on where in the world, where in the United States, where in uh, New Jersey people are searching uh, for various topics and how those patterns have changed uh, over time. And if you start using this data, I think uh, most people who use it, kind of initially you're like, well, you know, yeah, that's cool, that's everything, like, you know, but there's so much that goes on to a search is this data kind of meaningful? Are there meaningful patterns in this? And I think when you start playing around with it, I think pretty much everybody is pretty much uh, pretty quickly convinced uh, that the patterns in this data are indeed very meaningful. So this is uh, the percent, the search rate for Jewish, the percent of Google searches uh, that include the word Jewish uh, in different parts of the United States and different search in different places. And this has an R squared about 0.85 uh, with the actual ground truth. Here we know the ground truth. We know what percent of people are Jewish. We know that the the highest, the state with the highest Jewish uh, percent, percent is New York, and that Florida and California have higher Jewish populations uh, than Idaho and Montana, and that kind of is matched perfectly in the, in the, in the Google search data. Uh, compare that to the search rate for Mormon in the United States, and that gives a very uh, different pattern, uh, which also matches the Mormon population in the United States, which is overwhelmingly concentrated in Utah uh, and the counties that surround that. And I think one of the things that uh, right away uh, when we, you, you use this data, which is really important. Uh, it's not that everybody who makes a search that includes the word Mormon is Mormon. Uh, in fact, the most common search that includes the word Mormon, or not the, I don't know if it's the most, but one of the most common is Book of Mormon, which is a play <laughs> by the South Park creators, uh, and is probably uh, searched by a lot of South Park fans and Broadway fans and stuff like that. And I think that's going to kind of come into play any time you're using Google search data, which there's always going to be other reasons you make searches besides kind of what you're trying to measure. Uh, but oftentimes that kind of gets washed out in the data and because there are, you know, a ton of searches for Mormon history or good Mormon church. 
or things like that that people with that Mormons are more likely to make uh, than non-Mormons, you still do see this pattern in the data. And I think this is the huge advantage of Google search data. I, I really strongly believe this is the biggest advantage by far. So uh, psychologists and other social scientists for a while have known that people often lie uh, to surveys. If you ask people immediately after election, did you vote in the election, you know, days after election, something like 70, 75 percent of people will say they voted. Well, we can actually look at administrative records. We know that 70, 75 percent of people did not vote. Uh, people, uh, uh, people are going to lie in the direction of kind of what's socially favorable. I think. I just, I was, I was looking into. It, I was curious how much sex Americans have, and you look at surveys on uh, sexual activity. You see right away from the surveys that. People aren't being totally honest because if you look at just heterosexual sexual encounters, men report a lot more heterosexual sexual encounters than women report. So somebody's got to be not telling the truth. And then there is so there's a uh, if you look at kind of do the math on how much sex men say they're having, they say they're using 1.6 billion condoms in heterosexual year in heterosexual sexual encounters. Women say they're using only 1.1 billion condoms a year in heterosexual sexual heterosexual sexual encounters. So who's telling the truth, man or woman? Well, neither. About 600 million condoms are sold every year. There are men just lying over more than women. Uh, and I think, you know, that's kind of something you're going to find over and over again, where if it is a socially sensitive topic, you've got to be skeptical of what you're getting in surveys. And uh, I think over time, psychologists have found a way to kind of get people to be more honest in surveys. Uh, so it used to be that a survey was uh, you'd interview people or talk to a phone survey or in-person survey. Well, they found you'd get a lot more honest answers, a lot more socially undesirable behavior would be reported if you interviewed people online and also if they were alone. Well, this is kind of ideal for Google, right? Like you're online by definition and you're probably alone when you're doing a Google search. And then, uh, but I think even if surveys in the best case scenario, you're sti they're still going to run into a problem. I'm an economist, I study economics, and we're all obsessed with incentives. And no matter what a survey, no matter what condition the survey put people in, they have no incentive. You're never going to give them an incentive to tell the truth. You're never going to have an incentive uh, to tell, uh, to, you're never going to have an incentive to say that you're having, you only had sex one time last year, or that you, uh, you're, you're not planning to vote in the election. So people are always going to kind of assume, uh, just, just shade in the, in the direction of the truth. Well, Google, you have a very, very clear incentive to tell the truth. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, racism in Google searches. And if you find racist jokes funny, well, now you have an incentive to look up for racist jokes on Google because you find these jokes funny. If you need information on where a polling uh, location is, well, now you have a big incentive to search where to vote on Google. Whereas if you're not voting, you don't have this incentive. So the incentives are to tell kind of what you're interested in, what you want, uh, what you don't want. Uh, and I think. This, I think this fits with people's intuition. It also fits with uh, the data on Google. You might have sometimes seen Google autocomplete uh, when you're uh, typing a search, and often it'll have things that aren't uh, so PC. Uh, and, and that's with them trying to erase. They often try to erase some things that aren't totally PC. And even so, you see that people are making searches on top on things that they might not uh, often admit in polite company. And I think. Uh, Initially, porn was searched more than weather, but I think weather's now past porn. But, uh, that kind of gives you uh, a, 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 some idea of, of how much people search. And by the way, if you ask people, do you watch porn? I think it's about 25, only 25% of men and 4% of women say they've watched porn last month in the channels of the survey. I think the true numbers are like 80% and 20%. So, uh, so I think over and over again on these topics, you're really getting, I, I, I kind of want to emphasize, you're getting oftentimes misleading evidence with surveys. And you can often get better uh, data with uh, searches. So let me start with this first uh, paper, which is how much did racism cost Obama uh, in the election? And this is again classic. I think you have to ask like, what's the classic social kind of socially sensitive question? This is among the classic ones. How much would a black president lose votes uh, if he ran in the United States? And if you ask people in surveys, not no people, but very, very few people are going to say that they're not going to support Obama because he's black. So there are articles right before and around the election, Gallup, uh, race not important to voters. So that was kind of, they interviewed people, they said, do you care that Obama's black? And you know, 98, 99 percent of people said, no, this doesn't affect how we think of Obama. And that was kind of the end for Gallup and a lot of journalists during this time, uh, et cetera. 
And I think, uh, you know, that's not the only way to do it, to, 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 to get at this question, with just asking, are you not going to vote for Obama? So psychologists have, have, because people, this is a sensitive topic, psychologists have kind of uh, asked some different questions about African Americans that aren't quite as, like, explicit as, do you not like Obama because he's black? Uh, and, and some things that probably would strike you as very, as very racist, but actually a lot of people do say yes to, like, you know, do you think African Americans are less hardworking or less intelligent or things like that? It can correlate that with uh, with Obama's vote total, and you do see that it tends to be worse among people with his views. But there's kind of questions. Uh, it's also self-reported vote totals. There are a lot of questions go go in with that, and it overall tends to find a pretty small effect, about one or two percentage points that Obama lost uh, from people not not uh, supporting him due to his race. So this methodology is I, using this in, this intuition uh, that Google searches people are going to be very very honest, even on these sensitive topics is I'm going to try to measure in different parts of the United States basically how much racism there is based on Google searches. And after I do that, I'm going to see how did Obama do relative to what we'd expect him to do based on how other Democratic candidates will do. And I'll, I'll do a little bit more on that. Uh, by 2004 to 2007, well actually racism in search rates is very common. It's very uh, stable through time. You're not going to get very different results depending on the time period you use, so it's not too big a deal. But I want to avoid reverse causation, where you could imagine that some areas that didn't like Obama are then going to turn to Google and start doing a lot of racist jokes. Jokes. And I didn't want that. I want kind of a measure of that before Obama explodes on the scene in, in 2008. All right, so first issue, this map, I'm procrastinating on making it better always. And uh, it's, everyone always complains that it's an ugly map. And I say by next talk, I'll have it fixed. But uh, I never have it fixed. Uh, so I'll try to kind of talk you through this map. Uh, so the first issue when you're using Google data, I think the, perhaps the biggest issue with using Google data, or uh, there's this new field called text as data, which is really, really kind of a hot field, I think really important, that a lot of the data we're getting now is textual, uh, rather than kind of people answering direct questions. And the biggest issue you're going to face by far is that uh, there's a huge opportunity for cherry, for cherry picking. You basically pick, you want to show that Obama didn't do well because of racism, pick the term that shows that Obama didn't do well for racism of the, you know, a million searches that could be considered slightly racist. So I think a good way to avoid this, and one that I often use, is let's at least start with, is there one kind of term, or is there one uh, word that kind of is unambiguously the most salient one? And I think if you do that, you're kind of constraining yourself in a big way. And now I'm going to have to use uh, strident language, uh, if you can imagine what a racist word is. So this is the percent of Google searches that include the race word nigger, or it's plural. Uh, right off the bat, so first thing, when I first did this, everyone's like, well, this is, that's interesting, but there are going to be, you know, 500 people in the United States who make this search, and like, you know, what can we tell by what 500 people about the country's voting patterns? That's kind of an extreme thing to type in uh, nigger into Google as an extreme action. Actually, not really. There are millions of searches every year with this term. It's searched uh, during this time period, it's searched about as frequently as the term economist, my brain, uh, Lakers. Uh, it's within two orders of magnitude of the search weather. So I don't think you can really call this a fringe search by any stretch of the imagination. Another thing people said, well, isn't this, people, you might watch The Wire or listen to the Kanye West songs or Jay-Z songs and say, wait, isn't this just rap lyrics? People are just searching rap lyrics. Well, actually, this, the, there's another version of this word, nigga, that ends in A, that is the almost universally used in rap in uh, rap songs, and that gives a very, very different map than this. It actually uses control in the paper. Uh, so most people who look for rap lyrics, look for cultural things, are going to make that make that search or some version of that search. Uh, so, oh, uh, yeah, some. Some, I think some, some things about this, uh, this map were pretty surprising to me, at least. If you had asked me beforehand where is racism highest in the United States, I would have guessed it was like a southern versus northern thing. Is this but, normalized by population? So it's normalized by Google searches, which is probably even better. So it says a percent of Google searches. Oh, so the highest state is West Virginia. Uh, the lowest state is Hawaii. The highest places besides West Virginia are western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, uh, north, northern uh, upstate New York, uh, and also southern Mississippi and southern Louisiana. Oh, about 20% of these searches also include the word jokes. And if you're, uh, and if you're curious, and you're not going to mess up my research, like there are millions of searches, so 100 people search for this. Uh, it's not going to change the, the, the 
if Princeton's not going to also be the most racist place in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think that they're like, no. <laughs> they're not. But if you do that search for and jokes, uh, you're going to find, I think, some pretty disparaging views of African Americans. It's actually pretty interesting. Uh, Gordon Allpark, a famous psychologist, uh, wrote a famous treatise on uh, racism about uh, 50 years ago or so. And he focused he found focus like basically interviewing people and going to people's houses and around bars and he focused on the role that jokes play <coughs> racism. And it's kinda like you look at Google, it's like here's sixty years later and like this new data, it's like jokes are like this huge part of racism. Uh, which is, is is pretty interesting. And uh, so again, like really disparaging views of African Americans in, in a lot of these searches. And again, I don't want to say that everybody who makes this search is racist. There are people doing research. Uh, I think that's kind of why I showed the Mormon example initially. It's like let's just you know, there are things that don't, that aren't always searched for that reason, but you can still see patterns in this data that probably aren't meaningful. So, if you had asked me, I found this map kind of surprising for a couple of reasons. If you had asked me beforehand, I would have thought it was much more concentrated in the Deep South, but you can see places, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and parts of Michigan, upstate New York, it's really more East versus West now, it seems like uh, racism, uh, much lower in the Western part of the United States. The other thing is, you can kind of compare these to the demographics, and some of them aren't that surprising. It's places with more old people, fewer um, bachelor's degrees, smaller percentage of the population with bachelor's degrees. Uh, there was no correlation with uh, percent Democrat, even controlling for a whole bunch of other things. Like, there's never a correlation with percent Democrat, and that surprised me. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the surveys tell us that Republicans tend to be now more racist than Democrats, but that might be an artifact of the fact that social desirability bias makes a lot of places with white working class Democrats score among the highest um, um, uh, of racism. So I think that that kind of changed a little bit how, how, how I thought of racism. You can also see the time series of this, and some of the patterns are uh, uh, pretty disturbing. Like one of the time, so the, the time when it was highest, the day when it was highest was Obama's election day. On, uh, on the, Obama's first election day, uh, one in every 100 searches that include the word Obama also include the word nigger or KKK, which I just find a shocking fact. Like, of all the reasons to search Obama, that one in 100 is going to include that is, like, kind of mind-blowing to me. Uh, and it kind of spiked around the time Obama was election. election. kind of spikes whenever African Americans are in the news, either for good reasons or bad reasons. One of the periods when it was highest was during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, these searches were highest. And then also every Martin Luther King Jr. Day, searches for nigger jokes go up to about their highest level of the year, which is also pretty disturbing. Okay, so that's uh, so that's the map. So then, what are we? Gonna, how are we going to go from this map to how much did Obama lose in the election from racism? Well, what I want to do is compare how many votes, administrative vote data, not self-reported vote data, but how many votes did Obama get uh, in, in an area compared to how many votes he should have, and correlate that with racism. Well, how do we know how many vote, votes Obama should have received? Uh, we don't, but I think one thing we can do is we can compare him to the previous Democratic candidate, John Kerry. Is an area a county? Uh, so here, it's, sorry, it's, it's media markets. It's 200, there are 210 media markets in the United States. Uh, that's a group of about 10 category, counties. So I think you guys might be in the Philadelphia media market, I'm not sure. Uh, so it's, uh, there are 210 of them. They're defined by Nielsen for advertising reasons. Okay, so yeah, this map, I should have explained it more. Darker red means higher racism, lighter red means lower racism. White means I don't have data. There's actually, so this data is all public, uh, but actually if you go to Google Trends, you're not going to find this map if you type in uh, the N-word. What Google does is they uh, they make, a, they have like an, a ridiculously high privacy threshold, so if it's not searched a ton of times, they give you a zero, and it makes Google Trends data a lot more annoying than it, than it should be, in my opinion. Uh, and you're going to run into this problem a lot. So what I figured out is you can just do, you can take a very common search term, like weather, and then do weather or nigger, and then subtract them, and then you have. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, sounds very easy and very simple. You actually, because of sampling and rounding, you have to download a whole bunch of samples, and it took forever. And depending on the, the question, it's more difficult or whatever. But the white areas are basically just areas that don't search weather enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, really small. So, so we're going to compare this racism to Obama versus should have received, how much he should have received, I'm going to do is the 2004 vote total for John Kerry. Uh, these are pretty similar candidates ideologically. Uh, I don't want to say Kerry's a white Obama or, you know, or uh, 
McCain is a you know it's exactly the same as, as Bush, but if you score people there, they're, they're roughly similar elections. They're going to control for a lot of things afterwards. Uh, one big difference in the election uh, is that Kerry was running uh, against a fairly popular incumbent president in 2004, and Obama was running against uh, you know a woefully uh, uh, a very unpopular John McCain was being linked to George Bush. Republicans were incredibly unpopular. It's a huge Democratic swing election, so Obama does way better than Kerry. Obama wins, and Kerry loses. But you can see a very strong relationship between the difference in Obama and Kerry's support. Uh, that Obama does, you know, about eight or nine percentage points better than Kerry in areas with the lowest racism. But as a place has higher racism, Obama does worse and worse. And in places with the highest racism, Obama actually uh, does worse than Kerry, even though nationwide he was dealing with this good uh, Democratic swing. Uh, so is there more evidence than just this that this is actually racism? What's going on? Well, the first thing we do is we control for a whole bunch of things. We control for education levels. We control for gun ownership. Is it because of uh, differences in gun policy? We control for church attendance. We control for uh, you know all kinds of demographics: African American population, Hispanic population, Asian population, uh, age demographics. And it doesn't really change this result at all. We can also look at uh, the change in house voting over this period, uh, and. If there's not a significant relationship, it's a little negative because some of this effect is through turnout, which I've discussed a little bit in the paper, but uh, in general, not really much of a relationship with house voting and change in house voting up, uh, uh, and racism over this period, and no change in measures of ideology. It's not like these places that are more racist uh, did more, uh, became more democratic over this period. Also, uh, Survey USA did hypothetical matchups with, with uh, Edwards versus McCain, uh, Clinton versus McCain, and Obama versus McCain. And basically, uh, Obama does way worse than Clinton and Edwards in these hypothetical matchups among white voters in areas where the racism is higher. So I think the evidence is pretty strong. The other thing, you know, I first did this in 2000, uh, in, before 2012, and then after the election, I redid it with the new election data. So you can do, you can use the same X variable, racially charged search rating, the X variable, and you can use the Y variables, Obama 2012 minus Obama 2008. So change in Obama support over time. And you can imagine two reasons uh, why this might why there might be a relationship here. Suppose this is a trend in Democratic voting, then we'd expect this trend to continue going forward, right? So Obama 2012 would be worse in these areas than Obama 2008. Or suppose that this relationship doesn't really exist, but I just found it because, you know, social scientists tend to find relationships and then they, you know, that they cherry pick or do whatever. Then you, there would be regression to the mean and you'd see kind of an opposite relationship. But if you do Obama 2012 minus Obama 2010, 2008, but uh, points are all cl clumped together and there's no relationship. So I think that's even more uh, uh, convincing evidence that really what is going on is, is, is racism here. Uh, so how much overall uh, did Obama lose due to racism? Uh, we can do kind of a back of the envelope calculation and say how much would Obama have received if the whole country was the same as the racially tolerant areas. And then he lost about 3 to 5 percentage points of the vote, about 4 percentage points on average. Uh, that's about the loss of a uh, a home state advantage. And I think a bunch of people are kind of going, but did he gain votes because he's black as well? Uh, you might have had that thought. Uh, so he definitely did gain uh, votes from increased African American turnout. Uh, that effect is pretty limited. So blacks make up about 13% of the American population. They support Democrats overwhelmingly in every, in every election. So there's limited gains from that. You can do the calculation. He gained about one percentage point for increased black, uh, black turnout uh, versus about the four he lost from racism. As far as white voters who support Obama just because he was black, because they were moved by the civil rights issues and things like that, I really think that issue is very overstated in people's minds. I think it might have helped him in a primary, but I think in a general election, not really. So if you ask surveys, did you support Obama because he was black, or did you oppose Obama because he's black? Actually, a lot more, a lot more people say they opposed him because he's black than support him because he's black. And you might think that social desirability bias is going to you know, if anything, more people are going to not want to admit they, they opposed him as black. And already just very few say they support him because he's black. And then you look closer to the people who say they support him because he's black. And there are liberal Democrats who, who say they supported uh, every Democrat in every election ever, basically. So it's kind of, they're probably not interpreting the question right. They, they probably weren't actually voting for Obama in the general election because he's black. Uh, they probably just do like having a black president, but they would have supported any Democratic voter ever, regardless. So I think overall the evidence is Obama lost about uh, four percentage points of the popular vote uh, in both 2008 and 2012 uh, from uh, racism against uh, 
against him and gained about one to two from positive, uh, mostly from increased black turnout. So, and, and overall, it was a big uh, negative effect. And these effects, like anyway, you cut it, are much bigger than the effects that are found in surveys, which tend to find you tend to find you lost only about one to two percent of the of the vote from uh, from racism. So this kind of goes with my point that a lot of times surveys on these sensitive issues are really going to push things in the socially desirable uh, direction. So we're only going to have if you're only if people are going to not want to say they're racist, not want to say they're going to support Obama because of racism. So that's going to push that number down from the true number, uh, which is actually a lot higher. And I think it's a lot easier to get with some of these new data sources uh, that, uh, where people are more forthcoming. Is there any questions about this particular? You're assuming that everyone has the same notion of what's socially desirable? No, wait a minute. Well, when, when you say the, uh, when they fill out the survey, they all lean in the same direction. No, definitely not. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, they're. They're lying in the same direction. I think it's like, you know, it's like even think of like the sex thing, like women saying they have more sex than they actually do. Like you might think that a lot of women, like there's like this slut bias, right? So a lot of women are going to be, uh, you know, might, might want to say lower than it is, and some women might want to say, but there's also pressures to not be like an old maid, so there's going to be pressures to go down in that direction. But I think on average it leads to exaggerating it. So definitely. I think uh, in general, usually there is a direction where things are biased, but there could be people moving, you know, there could be people giving false lot lies in all kinds of directions. Definitely. This question of the resolution of the data, you have frequencies of search terms, their media market per year or per long? Uh, there's never really a straight answer to that, because usually when, there, when you don't have data, you can think of one of these hacks to get better data. Uh, so, uh, technically you could get daily data. There's also, so I've been using Google Trends here. There's also Google AdWords, which I found actually has better data. Like Google Trends doesn't tell you the absolute search volumes, they just tell you the rates. But Google AdWords actually will tell you absolutely how many searches are made, so that's another uh, source. And yeah, I kind of find you can usually get pretty good data but you kind of have to play around with the tool and learn, learn what you're getting and kind of learn ways to get more granular data than you want. But yeah, probably like sit, media markets by day would probably be about as low as, as you can get right now. So. Uh, could you say something about how the survey data map would look compared to the Google data map? Yeah, so a couple of things stand out. So one thing is that survey data is going to be noisier. So uh, Wyoming, so, so, so the question is, what would the survey data on uh, racism look like? So one of them is, uh, you ask people, do you oppose interracial marriage? And again, I say that people lie in surveys, but probably more people than you would expect still say they don't support interracial marriage in a survey. And you actually do see some variation in the states. Uh, I think there are a few, there are a few uh, weaknesses with that survey data. One is you have to aggregate tons of data just to get meaningful data. So I think the papers in that tend to use data from 1970 to like 2000. Uh, five or something, so it's, it's putting together a lot of data, you might miss some trends, you know, Pennsylvania has changed a lot since the 1970s, you're missing that. Uh, even with that uh, aggregation, it's still small data, so the survey data, one of the most uh, racist states by that measure is Wyoming, that's because two out of eight pe people said they opposed interracial marriage, so, you know, 25%, but it's not really a significant sample, uh, whereas this is considering the searches of millions of people. And then I think the differences that probably I think have to do with social desirability is that the survey data is much more concentrated in the South among Republicans. And again, my interpretation of that is that you know among Southerners and Republicans there might be less pressure to kind of hide your your racism, whereas among Democrats and Northerners it's kind of much less PC to be kind of open about that. So that the Google data is going to kind of push more in the direction of, of Democrats and Northerners, uh, and the survey data is going to push more towards Republicans and Southerners. And, and my interpretation, and also the relationship is much weaker with the Obama minus Kerry thing. So, yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, the other thing I was going to ask was, so they have the, I can't remember, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name, but they look at the, the polls versus the, the actual results, and they say that that ratio also shows the, the selectability of someone. Do you mean the, Brad, the Bradley effect? Yeah, the Bradley effect. How, how does that compare? Yeah, so, so that's kind of a different issue. That's... Uh, so that's that people are not going to, so the Bradley effect is, I think uh, there was a, 
New York City mayor, well, no, uh, there, was, there was a Virginia gov gubernatorial election or Senate election, and for a while in uh, elections with black candidates, the black candidate would do worse than the polls said they would do, and the idea there was that people didn't want to uh, admit to pollsters that they weren't supporting a black candidate. I think that really didn't come to play as much in this election. I think people were fine saying they voted for McCain, they just didn't want to say the reason they, they, weren't, vote, they weren't voting for Obama, because nobody's going to say, oh my god, you're voting for McCain. Uh, it might be more of an issue with some other candidates. I think they also found uh, David Duke, the like a neo-Nazi uh, in Louisiana, polls said he was going to do terrible, and he like I think won a House representative seat. Uh, I think that might be more of an issue where people really aren't going to say uh, they're they're supporting somebody like that, and you know that that might be an issue. I don't even know in other countries where some of these real right-wing parties are coming <coughs> into power. It might be interesting if, if search data is giving a different picture of how interest of interest in kind of some extreme candidates that people might not want to tell polls they're, they're supporting. But I don't think with the Obama elections it was, it was much of an issue, because I think people were per perfectly fine saying, uh, you know, nobody thinks you support making your racist. I don't think people were thinking that, so I don't think it, it really came into play this election. How representative is Google search data of the overall population views? And do you have concerns about certain socio-demographic groups being underrepresented or overrepresented? Yeah. I think, so it's going to move, it's going to lean in all the directions you'd imagine, younger people, more educated people, richer people. It is maybe more widespread than you think now. Although maybe less because a shockingly high percentage of the United States still doesn't use the internet. 30% of people, and I don't, I've never met anybody, so I don't know who they are, but uh, <laughs> they're definitely going to be missed by this. Uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of these kind of wash out across the state level, which is why you still do get meaningful information in different states. So the, the same demographic bias in West Virginia is probably going to play out in New Jersey, where it's going to lean among West Virginians towards the more educated uh, people through time. I think one of the issues is if you look at like a long time series, so uh, Hal Varian, who I was working for at Google, he used to point out that if you look at the time series, uh, Hal Varian's an economist, and he's, he's the chief, actually, he is the chief uh, economist. And uh, if you look at, he used to point out that if you look at searches for science over time, they've gone down. And a lot of people like have used this as this is the end of the world, everyone's losing interest in science. But probably what's going on there is that the earlier use of Google were a science, much more scientific crowd. So if you also look at like coding searches for time, like they tend to go down. I think the same thing's going on because probably co interest in coding is actually going up through time. But people are using Google in 2004 are probably a very tech savvy. I think those that issue is like now science is kind of stabilized and tech. That issue is probably less of an issue now because uh, kind of we kind of hit a more of a steady state where the people who are using the internet are using it, and the people who aren't aren't. But uh, yeah. can you talk a little bit about the choosing of the word? You mentioned that uh, uh, you really need to start with a term that's the most salient one to the issue being examined, and this one seems to be a pretty obvious word with maybe some equivalents, but yeah. probably the one that was most most obvious. In the situation where you're trying to figure out what that most salient word, do you have to do almost like a sensitivity analysis? Yeah, words? I think. How did you do this with this if you thought about you needed to? Yeah, so one of the things with this is that it not only is it like kind of most salient, it's so much more searched than all the other ones, that if you do this plus any other term, you're basically just doing this. So it's not like, it doesn't really change anything very much because uh, it's, the other ones are kind of just noise compared to this. The only difference is if you left this one out, which I don't think you ever would. Uh, yeah, I think the best thing is sensitivity. I think there are going to be situations where you're going to want to put together a whole bunch of searches. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in the future one, but it's definitely, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think it was, I keep confusing AdWords and AdSense, uh, ad, but there is a, you also mentioned privacy. So my question is this, is somebody who enters a, a racist search going to see ads like Join the KKK or something like that. Is that, is that, is that a, you know, can that be associated or does Google uh, um, prevent that? No, I don't think. So the ads that show up in your Google searches are just based on the search. Uh -huh. So it could be that if you make a racist search, like I don't know if, uh -huh. if KKK is full of terms for that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not based on that they think you're a racist or. Uh -huh. and so this is all anonymous aggregate data. I want to. I want to like, which is really important because these are, if, if people are making sensitive searches, you don't want to say, uh, you know, you know, that, yeah, that, that anybody's racist for any search. So this is all just anonymous aggregate data. Uh, uh, 
this is a lower bound, right? Because the the least racist parts of the country are also probably. Yeah, I, yeah, I, that's right. My guess is that it's pretty close to it, just because it's hard to imagine Obama lost that much and still won two elections. But uh, I think, yeah. <clears throat> Also, some measurement error will bias it towards zero, so I think, it, I think you should view it as a lower bound, but that it's probably not that much higher. Uh, although Obama did do pretty bad about, among white voters. Uh, that kind of got lost in all his, his victories. Uh, and, and it'll definitely be interesting, like the next election, if this goes, if we have like a positive line, and then you know, and, you know, the next uh, Democrat does a lot better among white voters. Although, you know, you could have a female candidate, which will bring along <laughs> this methodology to bear in a whole different way, and then, uh, so, you know, definitely more research to be done in these areas. Um, do you control all for how actively Obama campaigns in certain areas relative to Kerry? Because you might think that, like, you know, I'm losing West Virginia, I might as well not put, like... Yeah, I think someone, I think someone did... I did get the data somewhere on like ad spend. I think I did control for that. Didn't change that much. I think the ad spend is so driven by those two swing states that it's probably not too. They're both pretty much campaigning in the same states, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I also don't know how much Obama knew about. I think West Virginia. You're right. That, you know, West Virginia, low, like West Virginia, was not a swing state at all in any of Obama's elections. If, if Clinton was running, it may have been at least on the border of swing states, so it might have gotten a little attention. And I think. Uh, there was, you know, West Virginia, I think, uh, like Obama, West Virginia hates Obama so much that he, in the 2012 primary, he was running against a white convicted felon, and the white convicted felon got, like, I think 40% of the vote, or might even be one. <laughs> it was like, it was just insane. And, uh, yeah, like, West Virginia, Obama does horrible in West Virginia, and uh, they say it's because of the coal policy, but I think, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just, I mean, the Google search is, I think, you know, it's probably more than coal policy that's driving that opposition. And, you know, Hillary Clinton won like 80% of the primary vote or something in West Virginia. So, uh, yeah, that might that might be a little bit of a factor. Although, of course, if Obama's not going to campaign, then the other party's not going to campaign too, so that kind of evens out to some degree as well. Um, Alright, so let me move on to the next uh, paper. So, this one, the idea is, can you predict turnout and possibly elections uh, with Google searches? So the first thing is, can you predict elections with Google searches? And uh, when I first started writing this, it was before the election, and Nate Silver was like had all his models, and everyone like said like predict the election, like you're crazy not to. Like, you have all Google searches, like this is your expertise, uh, go for it. And I tried some things and wasn't having much luck. Uh, so like the most natural things that people suggest is just you know do you search for uh, Obama more than Romney? Like, do you support for one kind of uh, search for one kind of more than another kind of that? You realize right away it does not work at all. Like there are too many negative searches about Obama and negative searches about Romney. Uh, there are some subtle things that do have predictive power of whether people are going to vote. So one of the things I noticed is if a place searches for Obama Romney versus Romney Obama, like who's the first name, first candidate they put in the search, that has huge predictive power for which way they're going. Like if you're, if you're looking up Obama Romney polls, you're an Obama supporter. If you're looking up Romney Obama polls, you're a Romney supporter. So that was pretty cool, but. You know, so one of the issues is that we kind of already know how states are going to vote based on what happened four years ago. We know that California is going to go Democratic, that Massachusetts is going to go Democratic. About 90, or 90 plus percent of the variation in a state's election can just be predicted by what happened four years ago. So you add the Google data, it kind of has trouble doing much more than that, even though it does have some predictive power. Uh, and also, we've only had a couple elections, so it's kind of hard. You know, Nate Silver's been training his models on 40 elections or whatever, and getting better and better and learning what counts and what doesn't count. And we haven't really had that with Google Data, which only goes back to the <coughs> uh, So I'm skeptical at this point that Google Data is going to help much in, in predicting like, which candidate people are going to go for. Uh, but I think one thing that it is that does show more promise, and this is the second paper, uh, is predicting election turnout. And this one, unlike of polls, this is kind of like a black box. We don't really know which states are going to turn out a lot more than which other states. Uh, there's always a lot of uncertainty before it, uh, for the reason that for the reason that I mentioned, that people don't like saying that they're not going to vote. Uh, so it's it's very hard to predict uh, which states are going to are going to actually turn out and vote. The idea for this is simple. Uh, let's say if you definitely vote in an election, you may not need to turn to Google to learn where to vote or how to vote. 
if you never vote, you don't have to turn to Google. But if you sometimes vote, you probably have to look up where to vote, how to vote, information on voting, things like this. And these are the, precisely the, the people who are difficult to predict. So the idea for this is that we can, uh, by seeing how many people are searching for how to vote, where to vote, uh, leading up to the election, we can predict how many people are actually going to turn out in the election. So what I did is the percent of total Google searches that include the word vote or voting. And this kind of is the simple, is the similar to kind of like the most salient things. I don't know, I used two, they're both both search about the same. Uh, but also do some sensitivity checks. So I do the change basically in October and the rate at which people are searching for vote or voting. And I compare that on the x-axis, the y-axis is the change in turnout rates over the same period. So basically do people, if more people are searching for voter voting in October than they were four years earlier, can we predict that in November more people are going to turn out and vote than did four years earlier? And this is data from 2004 to 2008, the first presidential election, and you can see a pretty significant uh, relationship that there is predictive power. And this also holds controlling for a lot more things, information that you might have, like registration rates or early voting red rates or lots of other things. So there does seem to be a lot of predictive power in how many people are searching for vote in October and how many people are going to actually turn out to vote. I think everyone here is a social scientist. So I gave this talk to like computer people got into it and biologists, and they were all seeing these graphs and were just like ready to vomit because they're used to R squares of like 0.95 and everything. But now we're all social scientists. I think. <laughs> we're, all, we're all used to the same uh, the same uh, levels of R squared. This one's actually better. It's uh, the midterm elections. It's actually even harder to predict. The midterm elections are real crapshoots because a lot of people stay home and vote and don't vote on the midterm elections. Uh, and uh, this is basically the change in Google vote search rates from 2006 to 2010 on the x-axis, and then 2000 y is the change in turnout rates from the 2006 to 2010 election. And you can see it's a much higher relation, a much stronger relationship. Yeah. So, natural scientists here. Quick question about the R squared values. Do you have p values on those R squared values? Yes, yeah, so these are all very highly significant. If you have a 0.2 R squared on a sample of 51, it's going to be highly significant, like three or, or four at least. This is probably higher. Uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, so uh, yeah. So th now one question is. Uh, what can you do with this information? We don't really care that a particular state is going to turn out more than another particular state. Uh, probably people really obsessed with politics might care, but uh, other than that, turnout is not what we care about. We care about who's going to win. So one thing I did is I compared uh, for the midterm election the increased predicted turnout in Google, and you see that that predicts where where Democrats overperform the polls. And what happens in midterm elections is that Republican voters tend to turn out uh, regardless. They tend to be older voters. They're kind of they vote kind of regardless. And Democratic voters they tend to be younger voters and minorities are much more swing voters. So if you see that uh, Google is gonna, if you see that people are that, that voting might be very high in an area, it's probably a good sign in the midterm election that Democrats are going to do better than the polls are saying because the polls probably aren't capturing that increased turnout. The other thing you can do is you can really dig down into towns and cities. So before the 2008 election, one thing that would have been very, very obvious with Google data is that African-American turnout was going to go up. Because in places like Jackson, Mississippi, which is about 80% African-American, search rates for vote and voting in October were way higher. Now, you probably didn't need Google to tell you that African-Americans were going to turn out at historical levels for the first African-American presidential candidate. But if you can do this, you might be able to really dig down into what demographics are particularly energized and likely to, uh, to, to, to turn out and vote. The other thing you potentially do is uh, is you can see kind of like right after a, uh, something happens, how energized are people. So one thing you see is that the Friday after the presidential candidate gives his or her convention speech, searches for vote and voting go way up. People want to register to vote. On early voting, they're excited about their candidate. They're jazzed up. Uh, they basically go up to the same level every time, except for Romney's convention. They were basically flat. <laughs> and then like afterwards, that was like Romney's speech. They figured out that everyone hated Romney's speech. So this one, you might be able to see it a little bit quicker uh, that, that, that this search, that this, you know, that, that, that speech wasn't, wasn't winning anybody over. OK, well, one thing, I think another issue with this isn't just Google data. This is social science in general, is you do something and you find something. And then you do it out of sample, and it's always smaller. Uh, so after I did this, the 2012 elections were coming up. And I said, OK, well, let me try to predict the 2012 election. 
and it did okay. The, it's it's statistically significant even without uh, without uh, weighting, but it did a lot better with weighting. Uh, it, it actually it actually flub the flubs kind of make sense, but most of them because they had to do with Hurricane Sandy, which happened after the Google search data. Uh, so it was uh, if you remember the 2012 election, like that kid in New Jersey were all a mess with Hurricane Sandy, and they turned out lower, and I didn't predict that, so that's not really a loss. And then I also did the most recent midterm election. It does, it does better, though still a little worse than the original midterm elections. So there's little regression to the mean. Uh, yeah, so I'm not a big, uh, I should probably like clarify, I'm not really a big data expert in the sense that like this data is about 50 and 52 observations. Uh, I just call myself a big data expert because it fills lecture halls to call yourself a big, big data expert. <laughs> uh, and because like the Google data is based on big data and that people who actually have expertise in big data uh, are calling this down and going through spam filters and doing all these very, very complex machine learning things to make it small data for someone like me. Uh, but I think one thing I did learn being at Google and being around legitimate big data experts is this idea of cross-validation, which is the most obvious thing in the world and social scientists like have never done it and it makes no sense. If you, do, you, you predict your relationship on 90% of your observations and then you have an out-of-sample test and you see how well it does and it always does a little bit worse and you kind of can use that to learn a lot of information. Uh, so kind of doing it out of sample is similar. You know, if, you, if you've been doing an election, uh, if, if, you, if you do it for two elections, then you have your prediction from 2012, you can pretty much guess that it's gonna be a little bit worse because your, your subconscious is always finding things and stuff. Uh, but that's like a really great uh, methodology that the computer scientists are kind of ahead of, of the game on. And I think, I hope will trickle down to the social scientists and kind of Unfortunately, one of the reasons why it doesn't trickle down is because everyone's things are going to become a little bit smaller and nobody likes uh, having their coefficients go down to zero, but uh, I think that is uh, something that's going to be exciting in the future. One of the things that's also kind of surprised me about this is you can actually, because it's Google Data, you can break it down by day and try to predict turnout by day. And I thought that the biggest predictive power would be like the night before the election, like swing voters would search where to vote, how to vote, like right before the election and go out and vote. And actually, the time that predicts, like the days that predict the most, uh, have the biggest predictive power for the vote, are like early October, which is like really surprising to me. It's almost like people decide way earlier than I would have guessed uh, whether they're actually going to vote. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's the second one. Any questions about uh, this particular this project? Yeah. Are there any structured tools to see? what other terms people search for a term and look for, just in, in order to make the search a bit more guided? Yeah, so you can, yeah, so you can see basically the top searches in a search session, which is like fit, like a 30 minute window, uh, and that can, that can help, and that can kind of give you guidance on, uh, yeah, on what's going on. You know, when I was doing the racist search, for example, you could have imagined that one of the searches in the 15 minute window was like, Martin Luther King Jr. or like civil rights, and then you'd be like, oh, this is probably a research search. But it wasn't, it was like other racist jokes and stuff. So it's kind of, it kind of can tell you, uh, okay, like, yeah, you're on target. It's a, it's a great point, because it can tell you kind of you're on target. You know, oftentimes with Google searches, uh, you're a little, uh, you, you're a little in the dark of why exactly people are making searches. So that's a great way to kind of, uh, to kind of ground yourself. Okay, if people are searching this for the reason I think they're searching it. Why did you choose to do a log log plot when it's like one order of magnitude for the data? Uh, for a change in... For, uh, why, why is it a log log plot? Yeah, I think the Google searches, because the denominator is a little mysterious of so, uh, total Google searches, I think they tend to make more sense as, as logs. Uh, but often that can like artificially increase your correlation. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I definitely tried it with all kinds of different uh, measures and it wasn't different. Uh, I think, so the Google searches, if you go to Google Trends, you'll get not just, you'll get, it's, it's in rate, it's percent of Google searches, but it's also, they normalize it so that the top place scores 100, and then everything kind of weighed off of that. So it's kind of meaningless in a sense that like, so that's why kind of logs make more sense, because you kind of take out that meaningless normalization that they do, uh, if that makes sense. I think in Google searches, I tend to prefer logs because of this meaningless normalization, especially if you're changing things over time. Is there any reason to normalize the turnout rate? Uh, I mean, I think 
Yeah, so I guess that would be if population is changing. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, I'm 99% sure that I, I uh, did it with rates and it was very similar, but because of your questions, I will definitely double check that. Because uh, I, I definitely agree, you don't want to, in general, give yourself more degrees of freedom than you, than you, than you, than you, than you need. So. Um, I guess I'll so the third paper is uh, the effects of recession on child health treatment. And the question here is how much uh, does uh, an economic crisis, uh, how does an economic crisis such as the Great Recession affect child health treatment? And child health treatment is abuse or child neglect. It's a big issue in the United States, bigger than you might have imagined. There are about 3 million uh, reported cases of child abuse every year. And as I'm going to argue, that's only a small percentage of total likely cases. Uh, so many kids suffer from abuse, and I think I don't need to convince you that this is a major issue, but the evidence from psychology is overwhelming that this leads to massive uh, long-term trauma and problems and anxiety and mental illness uh, and crime and uh, basically lots of bad things uh, when people are abused. So how does uh, it affect you? How, how uh, does a recession affect child abuse? And if you look at the literature, you might you might think, and I was going, I went into this thing, this is a slam dunk, when, uh, when a recession hits, people are going to be depressed, people are going to be stressed, there's lots of bad things going on in the community, they're losing their houses, uh, children are going to bear the brunt of this. Uh, there's going to be an increase in abuse when, when a recession hits. And you look at the literature, it's actually, you know, uh, not really conclusive, and actually a lot of papers find the opposite relationship, that when an economic crisis hits, actually abuse, uh, surprisingly, goes down. And I uh, reproduce that with, uh, I, I'm going to compare on the x-axis, there's going to be a change in unemployment during the recession. So this is going to take advantage of the fact that the Great Recession affected different parts of the United States uh, differently. I think that's he took advantage of this a lot as well. Uh, is that you can compare the exposure to the recession, uh, Unemployment. You're going to change, compare un the average unemployment rate in 2009, 2010 to the average unemployment rate in 2006 and 2007, and ch compare that to change in child maltreatment rates during the, the exact same time period. And again, these are kind of arbitrary choices. I, I use them. Some other papers have made the same ones, so that's why I use them. But the results are very similar using different uh, time periods as well. And what happened is, in states like Nevada and Florida, unemployment went up by about eight percent but in states like Alaska, Nebraska, South Dakota, unemployment only went up a couple percentage points. So we basically want to see, in these states that were hammered by the recession, how did reported child abuse, child maltreatment change. And what you actually see is what some previous papers have found, and this surprising relationship surprised me a lot, is that in states that were hard hit by the recession, Nevada, Florida, uh, there was a big decrease. There was a, a significant decrease in, in reported child maltreatment rates. Uh, and this is sensitive to taking out some some big outliers and you get kind of in the nitty gritty of reporting and stuff, but uh, it seems to be a pretty stable relationship that in places that were hard hit, reported child maltreatment went down. And I want to argue, and I argue in the paper, that actually what happened is not that actual child maltreatment went down, but the reporting of child maltreatment went down. And this actually makes some sense if you think about it for a couple reasons. First, there are stories of people during the recession on the phone trying to get through to child maltreatment services who were all overworked and their budgets had been slashed and they couldn't actually get through so they, were, they eventually just hung up. So that probably happened. And I can also think that there were lots of cuts to first responders, the people most likely to report abuse. A lot of abuse reports come from uh, teachers and uh, police people, uh, policemen, firemen, and these are among the people who had biggest, uh, who were, these people had big budget cuts in the recession so they might be kind of overworked and less likely to report the abuse. And there are a few ways I test this hypothesis and I argue for this hypothesis in the paper. The first is just instead of using uh, instead of using all child maltreatment rates, and this is a lot of this is kind of standard in, in literature where there is a reporting bias, use an extreme version of it that has to be reported. So child maltreatment, there are about a thousand child fatalities every year that are called that are due to maltreatment. And these have to be reported. If a child dies, the authorities are reported, and authorities determine whether it's getting maltreatment or not. The disadvantage of this is it's a very, very rare outcome, so it's very, very noisy data. But you do see, although it's you know, borderline significant, that in places that were hardest hit by the recession, child fatalities from neglect actually went up. 
Uh, so at the bottom, for example, uh, there's a big increase in child fatality from neglect, even though there's a decrease in overall child maltreatment. And I think I interpret this as saying, uh, you know, if one interpretation of this is, well, it could be because of reporting, because these have to be reported, so that's the reason that it went up in, in the bottom. Is that, can you, is that done weighted by population? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I think I also did weight. I'm, I'm not sure I can try it. That might deal with, yeah, because the small samples. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be it. The other thing we can do is we can use Google searches. I think there are two ways to use Google searches to try to get at this question. The first one is let's use people. I kind of view this as almost like a big poll of the country. Whereas if you see something, if you see a kid with a bruise or you see something that might not look right, you might look at, into child abuse, child abuse, uh, what is child abuse, how do I know there's child abuse, things like that. So I do using kind of the common term, uh, what the percentage searches that include child abuse or child neglect. And the, there are millions of these searches every year. Again, you know, this is pretty blunt. There are a lot of people searching child abuse for, for no reason, uh, but not because they suspect any child abuse, but because, uh, you know, for other reasons. But I think it might get, a, 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 even if it's blunt, it might get kind of some idea of suspicions of child abuse. And one question that comes naturally is, well, does every, maybe everybody who, sus who suspects child abuse is going to just then report it. Isn't this kind of the same thing as reporting? But if you ask surveys, uh, I think about 30% of doctors admit that they did not report a suspected child abuse case. And doctors are, by law, mandated to do that. So that's kind of something people probably don't want to admit. So I think in general, probably only a small percentage of suspected cases are actually to get through to, the, to, the, to, to be reported by uh, to the authorities. So this is a child abuse, child neglect. Actually, if you look at the period, it does correlate reasonably strong overall in the cross-section with Child, child, child abuse rate. So in, in, in states like Iowa and West Virginia, where oh, absolute levels of child abuse are high, uh, there are also higher search rates for child abuse. And this is highly, I mean, so one of the things, this is much bigger data than the child fatality rates. Uh, and this is highly statistically significant, where places that uh, had big increases in unemployment uh, saw a big increase in searches for child abuse, a comparative increase in searches for child abuse, child neglect, uh, searches of that nature. Which, again, that's by no means a slam dunk. I don't think you'd say because people are searching more child abuse, there are more child abuse cases actually going on. But I think it does go with the evidence from the child fatality and some other evidence that maybe at least raises questions about this official data. That we have to question, I think, did there really was there really a decrease in child maltreatment in places like Nevada or Florida, considering it's increases in child mortality and also increases in uh, searches for child abuse and child neglect. Uh, can you uh, look at this with uh, smaller geographic units like uh, I didn't, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so, so one of the reasons I didn't is because the child abuse data, which I was starting with, is all at the state level. Yeah. But that is like that is a good idea because that's kind of another advantage of this data that you can get smaller. Maybe counties, but definitely media markets, the 210 media markets, and get some more power. Uh, as far as the Google data, you could find it at a really small unit, like you can get city data. So the city data is actually noisier. Uh, I think there's only a certain level of accuracy of knowing where you actually are. You might have actually looked at like your Android at some point and it thinks you're in the city next next over rather than the city you're actually in. So it does get noisy. That's probably not an issue in media markets or in uh, or in uh, uh, states. If you, if you look more specifically, let's say, at how to, how to report child abuse, something that is clearly, uh, or, or almost certainly by somebody who is interested in, in how to do it, does that, does, does that, does that strengthen this case, or is it? It's, it basically, these searches are too, so one of the things that surprised about Google data to me is once you get to four word searches, they get way rarer than like one or two word searches. Uh, like way, way rarer. Really. Even, even report child abuse? Yeah, like they weren't, I was, I was just getting like really noisy data, which was surprising to me. I, I, maybe I can look at it again. It's, it's a great question because, you know, there are lots of interpretations of this reason. And, uh, and somebody, by the way, somebody could just be reading about a lot of child abuse in their area and yeah. they're concerned about it. And then yeah, so, because of this feedback, they're, they're just... So one of the things I looked at is media stories uh -huh. on child abuse. And I think they weren't, uh, if I remember correctly, they weren't. Uh, differentially affected, but that's that's a great point. And you know, I I, I was kind of I was kind of a little sketchy of using. So what I really wanted to do initially was this, which is uh, and sorry, this is a little disturbing uh, footage. We have to do is that forget you know suspicions of child abuse. You can actually you know use victims 
uh, of child abuse, which is like, and, and so right off the bat, and again, this is disturbing, obviously, uh, is that this is rare because, you know, three left, three word, four word things are rare. Uh, and this is only going to be, uh, this is only going to be a small subset of kids. This isn't going to be young kids because they're not using the internet. This is more, you know, someone says I'm 18 and my dad just hit me. This is 13, 14, 15 year olds. It's not, it's not quite as, as sharp. I think this actually, and I suggested when I wrote this, this actually might be way, but I think it will be a lot better for domestic violence because then you have a lot of women right after uh, getting in a, in a, in a, in a fight. So we'll Google something like my, my husband just hit me without it, whether or not they go through with, with reporting it. Uh, so, so this one's noisier, and like if you actually do the state level data, you get even worse than the child fatalities, where it's just like the swings are just like all over the place and not really meaningful. Yeah. One thing you might want to think about is there's a big literature which suggests it's not the dads that hit the kids, it's the stepdads and the mom's boyfriends, and you know not blood relations to the to the offspring. An awful lot of domestic violence comes comes from there. I'm not suggesting dads don't hit their kids, but yeah, uh, you, you might think about that in a more nuanced way. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. You can also like actually, you know, break down the genders of this. Another one that is that moms. I wrote this up as a, as my New York Times columnist using my dad hit me, and like I got about ten calls from people who have been abused by their moms who are very very angry that like this is this. Uh, and I think actually the searches are my mom hit me is plenty is almost as common as my dad hit me. So it actually, I just mentioned the article. But I think that's right that some of the, you know, some of the things are wrong. I think, yeah, I I don't know. You know, you also get the issue of do people actually search when a stepdad hit? Do they clarify that a stepdad hit them, or do they just say, uh, my dad? So if I was going to back you away from this just a little bit, how, how would you think about using a stream of searches to pin things down? For example, you've got one search. And it's really interesting, but presumably the different contexts of searching, right, yeah. will will lead to a different history of searching. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you thought at all about how one uses sequences of searches because these are very complicated problems. Right? Yeah, I um, totally agree. Yeah. Uh, but you don't get that, do you? Uh, there are, yeah, you can do like searches within a 15 minute window, but you don't get the pure. Like this is everybody searching. You actually there was. But when a you say you don't get it, I mean you work for Google. They have this. Well, no, I don't thing. work for Google anymore. Oh, uh, so there are, pri there are privacy implications oh, of all this stuff. I see. Uh, and I think also they they don't particularly love an employee kind of using their data and coming out and saying that they found something that academics can't reproduce. And I oh, think I see. rightfully so. Mm -hmm. uh, Google got in a lot of trouble. I don't know if anybody followed it, but they tried to predict the flu before uh, the CDC could predict it, and they did it all internally with their internal data. And then it didn't work. Like it, it, it kind of blew up. Where uh, for an interesting reason, basically, uh, people were searching for news to kind of relate to your child abuse. Your child abuse point is that people were searching for news stories around child uh, around mm -hmm. flu, and they didn't have flu, mm -hmm. and it all blew up. And it said flu was way up, and it wasn't. And kind of Google took it a little on the chin for like you're just telling us this black box that you predicted the flu, and like you know we think your methodology is interesting. We still think it's interesting. Like even after it didn't work, mm -hmm. we want to. You know, update this model and stuff. So I think, uh, you know, and there are privacy implications and stuff. I think so. AOL a while ago, they uh, they released academics about uh, like uh, one percent of their users. They released all their searches, of just their user IDs. They said it was anonymized, and people very quickly could figure out whose uh, searches, uh, whose searches were whose, and. Uh, like you could kind of do the trail. They search themselves. They search their address, and then they search for herpes cure. And <laughs> a lot of people didn't like that. That was now all out there, as you can imagine. So I think that has made companies a lot more cautious, both with good reason and bad reason. Because I think like I think now they're too cautious because you know like I don't think they're. Pro I think they're, I think we're way too far on the line of like let's make sure eight thousand people have searched it before we show it to you, and it's kind of like you know I think we we're good like. I don't think, uh, you know, I worked at Google. I'm a pretty nosy person. I didn't find anything about anybody like, like, <laughs> like that could be, like the privacy implicate, like even internally, externally, like the privacy data is like, like the privacy uh, rules are very, 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 very strict uh, to make sure. And like, like I said, a lot of it's for good reason. Like we do not want anybody, any researcher knowing what a particular person searched. That's like 
crucial. We don't want, uh, you know, we don't we don't want that that personal information out there. Uh, but I think because of that, there's a little bit of like an extreme maybe overreaction where some of these questions there probably are ways to get an anonymous and aggregate and learn a lot about people uh, while still making sure that you don't know anything about a particular uh, person. Yeah, but the stream of searches is definitely interesting. Even just looking like what people search like in the 15 minute window. Like one of the things I found, I did a story on how many people are gay, and like I was doing a lot, I was doing a lot of like what, what people search around gay stuff, and one of the things you see is like immediately surrounding a search for gay porn, a lot of people, particularly in southern states like Mississippi, search for gay test, which is like they're panicked that they're gay because they just uh, looked at, at gay porn, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Kind of like, uh, you kind of imagine that they're kind of at war with themselves at that point, right? Like without going too much, uh, that they, they've just searched something that they don't want that search and want to kind of figure out uh, what this means and try to avoid some of that, so, uh, I think, yeah, so this data, this is where I was initially going and I was trying to do the statewide data and I was finding that it was just way noisy, like everything was swinging like 300% and you couldn't really get much, but there is some information I think in the time series, if you do the time series of, of these searches, they tend to go down up until, up until the recession and they go up during the recession. So I think this is kind of consistent with that, where, the, where, where that's a little less noisy because of the national level. Yeah. Seems like a really straightforward way would be to look at unemployment and first responders as a control. Because you told that story right in the beginning. So why why wouldn't you add that and see if you can do anything excess with this? Group? Yeah, I think it's a great point. I am a little weak on power. It might be another reason to get down to smaller levels of geography. Because you are a little weak in power with, with 50 observations or whatever. But uh, yeah, maybe with the county level and stuff, that would be, or city level, like police cuts and stuff, yeah, that would be great. And, yeah, you can kind of do some stuff like that. And definitely with this debt, I mean, this is one, you know, that I think, uh, as you mentioned, there are some ones where it's like the raising of one, there was one word, like boom. This one, there's of like, you know, kids searching something horrific like this, there is not. Uh, one more, one cert, obvious search. There are a lot of searches that are made with about the same frequency. There's my dad hit me, my dad hits me, dad hit me, dad beats me. They're all kind of searched about the same way. And I, what I kind of do is like, you know, uh, try to, in this situation, and again, this is kind of new research and we don't necessarily know the right approach, is try to put all of them in and then do a lot of robustness checks. What happens when you take out, you know, two of them randomly and you're still getting similar results is one of them driving this, this path. This is definitely one where you don't have that kind of one, like this is what you can do uh, in general. So. Yeah. So I think this kind of brings us back to a more general question of when we're looking at these data sets, we're trying to say, okay, we're searching, we're looking at searches, but then there's the fact that we have to be in a certain mindset in order to be able to search. Yeah. So how do we negotiate the fact that we are searching for something on Google? Specific syntax, and how do you negotiate that state? Yeah, so, so one of the things I say is it, it's we need to do a lot more research on it. I don't know that we know the answer to that. I think I think you know there there are issues. So I, in my sex column, I talked about all the sexual searches people make and how everyone's insecure. And I think I I said that men make more ask more questions about their penis than any other body part. And then, and then, uh, like some of like, criticized me. Dan Ariely actually criticized me. He said that, well, there's actually a bias because you go to Google for the things you're embarrassed to tell anyone else. So if you have a question about like your ears, you might just ask your, your you know, your your wife or something, but you don't really go, uh, you know, to Google. You know, so it's kind of like that's kind of interesting balance. In some sense, it's almost the opposite uh, bias as surveys. So surveys tend to. Exact, tend to underestimate the things we find embarrassing, and maybe that Google overestimates the things we find embarrassing. Because we go to Google precisely because we don't, you know, more often when we don't want to ask anybody else. Uh, isn't it possible that if you're really successful at this, it, it might reduce the value because people, you, everybody's heard about Google bombs. So people will, which is a, a concerted effort to have the autocomplete uh, produce something unfavorable to a, to a candidate or whoever. So isn't it possible that that if if your methodology is really successful and people see that real decisions are being based on searches, then there will be a kind of active uh, there will be active campaigns to, uh, to to use the algorithm to achieve desired results, and that will complicate at least your yeah definitely. The only thing I have in my favor is that Google puts a lot of money into fighting these types of 
attempts because there already are those incentives from a lot of companies to get like their search to mess around with search with search data in various ways. And uh, I think a you know publicly released that a lot of searches are by bots uh, for various nefarious reasons from companies. And Google puts a whole bunch of energy into kind of finding that and getting rid of it. So, well, I mean, but I was just saying that if it's easier to detect a bot than it is uh, the concerted, independent efforts of, of lots of individuals who, you know, who seem to be spontaneous. It's possible. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's possible. So, another question here. What is Google's incentive for exposing all this data, and what do those incentives tell us about how it's shaped or or what is suppressed? Or? Okay. So I don't work for Google, obviously. Uh, as I said on numerous occasions, I don't work for Google. I speak for Google. I think this is actually a major issue. So people have talked about privacy, <coughs> and I think that's a correct issue. Uh, like that, that is an issue. I think it, it's overdone because the companies have so much incentive to protect people's privacy. Because if you know Google released, if Google had an AOL release or something like that, they'd be like almost out of business. Like people would be so pissed off. That I think the companies have huge incentive to, to make sure that everyone's privacy is protected. I think an issue that people don't think about is exactly the issue you're talking about. Where now, like it used to be that governments had the best data. You know, the census, CPS. Uh, all these surveys, and their job was to give this to researchers to, freely to get to get the truth. Like that was their sole mission. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's basically its job to like help researchers figure out what's going on in the economy. And I think now the best uh, data, by and large, is in corporate hands. And I think their incentives can be very, very different from the incentives of a government agency just concerning research. And a lot of incentives come into play. PR is one of them, etc. So I think, you know, I think it's great that Google does make this data available. I think part of the reason for that is because there are a lot of scientists who came who are at Google who kind of want this data out there and want people to do research on it uh, and kind of, you know, and, and stuff like that. But I think it's going to be an increasing, it's going to be a big issue going forward is what do we do with this data and how do we make sure that this very important data about who we are is like open to the public and various ways. So uh, you might have also seen Facebook very famously did a, a study where they manipulated the, the posts of mood of the mood of users. The posts of, of the mood of the, the, the mood of posts that people saw and then they wanted to re see how people's mood responded to that. And it was an A-B test and they published it and they got hammered in the press because it sounded very, very creepy. It's like Facebook's manipulating your mood. And like I kind of get the outrage and get the like I get what people are getting at, but like I do think there is a an alternative, like a an opposite issue which may prove just as strong, which is companies just don't want to deal with PR of things that sounds a little creepy or freak people out, even if there aren't any privacy implications, and that they just don't they, they don't not a, a, enough research is done with what I think is very very powerful data. Like I think there there are probably diseases that could be cured in Google's database if we actually like had access. If researchers had access to all of Google's database, I think there could be potentially you know, new insights into into a lot of illnesses and stuff like that. Uh, you know, a lot of like cures of illnesses have been found when like people found that one particular place had the illness way higher or way lower than a lot of other places, and they kind of said, "Well, what's going on in that place?" So you imagine if we have now all the Google searches on basically every illness, and we could get small geographies, we might find that there are certain places that, for mysterious reasons, have this illness way higher than everybody else, and then it's like, well, why? And then, and then the next question, why? We might eventually be able to, to cure diseases. So I think it's really, in, a, in my opinion, a very, very important and under-discussed issue, which is, you know, how do we make sure that this powerful data is available to researchers? Uh, you know, and, and that the corporations aren't, you know, the, that their incentives are aligned with researchers, or if they aren't aligned, that they're forced to, uh, to kind of make it in the public interest. Anyways. I have a super boring, mundane question, but I imagine I'm not the only one. For your early papers, before you did have a more formal relationship with Google, were you just like, like, are you copying and pasting county at a time? Or when I've gone through Google Trends, it's like not easy to extract the data. Yeah, I was doing it manually. Like I was, I had to download 5,000 samples of things for the hack that I described, and I just basically paid people to do that. Uh, there are APIs. 
I find for a computer scientist, like I use APIs less than everybody. Like I don't really mind typing things in a hundred times, which is probably stupid. Uh, there are now Google Trends APIs, which uh, should make this all a lot easier. I do, a, I do a, probably way more than I should manually. Uh, and Google AdWords the same way. If you go through, like I go through them all. Everyone thinks I'm using an API, and I'm just like going through them manually. What about financial crisis, economic crisis? Uh, what do we know uh, now that we didn't come to Yeah. Uh, well, I think probably Dave has, some, uh, has given us thought us the most on some of these crises. But, uh, I, I, and that's not using Google data, but it is using, I think, a lot of corporate data resources, right? Uh, right. But that's the transaction data. Yeah. So, I mean, it's in some sense similar. and I. I almost give the floor. I think anything that he's learned is way better than anything that anyone's learned with Google data. So uh, I think with the Google data, and stuff, so one issue with uh, with financial crises or big recessions or big depressions, they only happen once, or they've only happened once. So you do get into big issues where a lot of people came out with studies, kind of like, look, you can predict financial crises based on Google searches, and I'm not convinced by that because I kind of feel like they, kind of looking backwards, yeah, of course you can. If you knew there was a financial crisis, look what people were searching. But can you the next time uh, when there's, you know, the next time, do we really know that it's going to be the same pattern of searches that would lead to a financial crisis? I think, I don't know. Uh, so, I don't know, yeah, do, you have idea, do you have ideas on things you want to see studied? Or? I'm, I'm really has been doing this now casting. Right. So, so that's, I, I don't know if the Fed and others have looked at this no, they have, so yeah, so how variance now casting stuff, which is a little different than a financial crisis, is actually can we predict unemployment, kind of similar to Google Flu, can we predict unemployment for the the data? So the data takes you know a week or two weeks to come out. Can we predict unemployment before the official data comes out? And how's to find a lot of success with uh, with a lot of that stuff. And Hal's also going over like after like how variance the chief economist at Google. He's going after like some very big ambitious questions involving the economy and Google searches, which I think also makes total sense. Like, kind of one of the themes this talk is kind of big, ambitious questions because the data is so new and exciting that the worst things happen, you're too ambitious, like who cares? But it's possible that there's information in Google searches about how the economy works that we'd never otherwise know. So it kind of makes sense to, you know, take a chance there. Uh, but I'd rather have access to credit file data. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, yeah, I think uh, that that's probably, you know, I think in general, there are a lot of situations where Google searches, on the sensitive topics, I think Google searches are usually the best variable. And if it's not a sensitive topic, Google searches are usually the second best variable. And then it's a question of whether you can get the first variable. And if you can't, then you use Google searches because you couldn't find them. And if you can, then you use the better variable. Uh, so we're doing a study on, uh, uh, also with Hal Barron at Google, on uh, movie sales. And initially, we're using Google searches as a proxy for movie box office demand, because it's a pretty good proxy. If people are searching for a movie the Friday before it comes out, they're probably going to see the movie. Then we're able to get actual box office data, and then it's like, well, you don't actually need the Google data if you get the box office data. So uh, <coughs> that happens a lot. Is it, uh, is it Google policy not to profit directly from what is learned in this research? I can mean, imagine with a cash, you know, with a, with a cash holding the size of Google's, if you really did find a method to, to predict stuff accurately, uh, Google could, uh, and, and it, you know, Google executives could do even even better than how they've done. Is that, is that Ill considered illegal? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, I don't speak for Google on this at all, and I don't work there. Yeah. All those caveats understood. I just know that I read publicly, like a newspaper article, where Sergey Brin had said, we should just predict the stock market. Like, <laughs> that's what Google should do, think how much money we make. And Eric Schmidt just like laughed him out of the room as like, that's the craziest thing you've ever said and like the legal ramifications of that are so beyond like, you cannot, you cannot predict the stock market with very, like, no, basically no. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, you could do it, you could do it once and really before the, before the legislature is illegal. You, you could do it once and get away with it, but of course it would just work this, so, so it, uh, it, it, it wouldn't improve nothing. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's not to say that there aren't companies with uh, financial information that are profiting from it. MasterCard makes a ton of money selling their data to hedge funds. 
Uh, <coughs> so, yeah. So, like, Google's market share has been as low as, like, 60% for Facebook searches. So, have you used Bing and been able to replicate these results? Uh, Bing's just, their system's not really in the same, like, it's not really up and running in the same way, so no. And Yahoo used to have some data, but it was also kind of, I think, a little... You know, Google is, because they have so many smart people for so long working on this, like, the data isn't... Like, all these things that would be impossible for me, like cleaning out spam and getting rid of bots, like, all these things that are really huge issues with this data, like, are all just kind of already done and, and stuff, but the data is just in such so much cleaner shape. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how whether it would look different with the Yahoo data. How do you think the difference is between using the Google Trends and using the, the firehose from Twitter? Uh, yes. Well, here. yeah, so I think that one with Twitter, I think, you know, the, the issues with Google's sample selection, that it does have a sample bias, of, sample of the population, is a big issue. But I think with Twitter, it's like a way bigger issue. Like, Google at least has 60% of people. Like, probably everyone here uses Google. I'm not sure that everybody here makes tweets. Uh, so, I don't, I think that is a big issue. And the other thing is just, you know, if I'm right that social desirability bias is the best focus of this, like, Twitter and Facebook are just worse. Like, however bad a survey is, Twitter and Facebook are worse than a survey. Because not only are you, you have no incentive to tell the truth, you have incentive to lie to make yourself look good, right? On Facebook, everybody's, like, happy and has a great family and <laughs> loves, their, you know, and never gets in any fights with anybody and is in the Caribbean every other weekend. <laughs> like, that's not real life, right? So, like, I think in some sense, like, I think, I think too, like, this is a little bit inside baseball, but in the big data world, I think too much attention has been paid to social media because it has kind of a cool name, and too little attention has been paid to search because I think social media is this very biased view of things based on, uh, you know, what people, based on how people want to come across, and it's in many ways worse than surveys, whereas I think Google really has this honesty that we've never really had before in a, in a, in a data source. No. Oh. Oh yeah. So yeah. So I think the great. Uh, yeah. So the CPS data, great recession, increased child abuse. I think based on not just Google data but mortality data, and I'm going to take a lot of your suggestions into account and looking this closely. So that's the other thing about Google data in general. I think it's very good. One of the reasons that it fits so nicely into a newspaper is it's very good for being provocative and kind of telling a sort like a, it's it's not as good as nailing things down. If you want something in like the QJE or uh, AER, or the top economics journals, they tend to want like you've really nailed this question 100 percent and we know it and, and we now know the answer. I think with some of these new data sources, they often get something like this child abuse story, where I kind of think these data sources all together are telling us that maybe. Uh, we're missing the story with the official data, but I don't think that you know there's a smoking gun necessarily found, and it's definitely an area uh, more maybe more raising questions than uh, giving definitive answers. And then yeah, conclusion. I really think anonymous area Google searches excellent new data for social sciences, really underused in my opinion, uh, and particularly on the socially sensitive topics. And then you know that's my website where I have uh, more of these. Um, you know, articles and also uh, more academic papers on this topic.